most of you know, my name is Matt Graybaugh, and I'm the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services At-Risk Species Coordinator for Arizona and New Mexico. I sit over here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, for almost two years now, I've been working with the CCAS team, which includes Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Christy Miner, who you see here as our coordinator from the University of Arizona, and early on, Alex, Alex Caberly, who now is with uh, Cornell, but um, helped launch the community practice when we got started. Uh, before the official community practice launch about two years ago, uh, we had a series of meetings where we invited federal and state agencies to come together to help identify some early research needs, uh, particularly for American bullfrogs and, and crayfish. And those were announced in a competitive funding announcement um, in, yeah, about two years ago. Uh, at the same time, the Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program was able to fund some additional research through um, Arizona Game and Fish uh, related to uh, non-native fish movement in the Grand Canyon. Um, and that'll be one of the presentations today. Um, in addition, um, I'm not following my script, Christy, but getting back to the, uh, the competitive funding announcement for bullfrogs and crayfish, we're, we were able to fund four projects through that competitive funding announcement. And we will hear about one of those projects today as well. With that, I'll hand it over to somebody whose thoughts are probably more organized than mine are today on a Thursday. And uh, Christy, I'll hand it over to you to do the introductions. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christy Miner. Uh, as Matt said, I worked for the University of Arizona's School of Natural Resources and the Environment, and I've been working with the CCAS team as the non-native aquatics community practice coordinator for the last year. Um, we'll go ahead and move into our first presentation. Uh, so for this first presentation, Susan Wood and Rebecca Best from Northern Arizona University uh, and David Ward from USGS will provide some updates on their project, ammonia chloride as a tool for eradication of invasive crayfish. If you have any questions during this presentation, please just put your questions into the chat as we go along and I will relay them to the speakers afterwards as long as we have time. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Susan. Thanks, Christy. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, so as Christy mentioned, I am a first year master's student at Northern Arizona University in the Environmental Science and Policy Program. And I'm working with Dr. Rebecca Best and David Ward from USGS and we are investigating whether ammonia could be used as a tool for removal of invasive crayfish. So I'm going to give a little bit of introduction and background, talk about the experiments that we've done so far, what we're hoping to achieve in the next few months, and then have some time at the end for any questions. Okay, so crayfish are some of the most widespread and destructive invasive species, and they are a huge problem all over the world. Um, you can see this just by perusing the literature and some of the titles out there. For example, Crayfish in Europe, How to Make the Best of a Bad Situation, How the Red Swamp Crayfish Took Over the World, and Managing Invasive Crayfish, Is There a Hope? Um, these are all pretty grim, but there are a lot of great people working on this problem, and I think that is pretty hopeful. Um, so Arizona is actually the only state in the lower 48 that doesn't have any native crayfish. Um, now we have two non-native crayfish, the northern crayfish, which is native to central and northern um, United States and southern Canada and the red swamp crayfish, which is native to the lower Mississippi River Basin and Northern Mexico. And this is, these are their distributions in Arizona. Um, the Northern crayfish is definitely more widespread um, and there are a lot of them up around Flagstaff here. And the red swamp crayfish seems to be more Southern and more West and a little less widespread. And I got these 
maps from um, imapinvasives.org, which is a really cool database and a great tool for anybody interested in invasive species in Arizona. So people have been trying to address the crayfish issue for a while, um, but haven't been totally successful. Uh, the most commonly employed method has been mechanical removal, specifically trapping. This picture is the signal crayfish, which is invasive in Europe, and trapping has definitely not worked on this species. Um, trapping selects for large adult males, and that they're really only a small proportion of the population. And when you take out large adults, you enable the juveniles to thrive. Um, trapping can reduce crayfish numbers quite a bit, but it has to be a pretty intensive effort for it to do so. And like any mechanical removal technique, it's never going to remove all of the individuals in a population. Um, there has also been quite a bit of research with biocides, using biocides against crayfish. Um, in Europe, they've done a lot of studies using pyrethroids, which are derived from chrysanthemum flowers, but can also be synthetically produced. Um, and pyrethroids seem to target arthropods, but they are very toxic to other aquatic organisms. And as you can see in the picture on the right, um, you have to treat the surrounding shoreline for it to work on crayfish. Um, the crayfish sense the pyrethroids in the water and they try to leave. So if you don't treat the surrounding terrestrial environment with this chemical, then it's just not going to work at all. And biocides are pretty controversial. There are no species specific biocides. There are definitely no crayfish specific biocides, um, but this is still one of the few techniques that could potentially remove all the individuals in a population. So we think that ammonia could be a potential biocide or chemical removal tool. Um, and there could be a, quite a few pros to using a tool like ammonia. Um, it's naturally occurring. It's the natural waste product of aquatic organisms. It also breaks down naturally in aquatic systems. Um, in the nitrogen cycle seen here, uh, bacteria break down ammonia, and then it is taken up by plants or released as N2 into the atmosphere. Um, it's toxic at higher concentrations, and that toxicity can be manipulated relatively easily. Um, so quick biology review here for everybody. Um, crayfish have gills like fish. They are located under the cephalothorax at the base of the legs. And just like fish gills, they have these gill filaments and lamella structures and oxygenated water washes over these structures, enabling oxygen to be diffused through these membranes into capillaries, and then oxygenated blood is transported throughout the body. Um, and this is also the mechanism for how ammonia will enter the body. It enters through the gills into the bloodstream and then is transported throughout the body. So with that in mind, we'll talk about the two forms of ammonia in aqueous solutions, the ionized form, NH4+, and the unionized form, NH3. NH4+, is usually prevalent in higher um, concentrations, and the ionized, unionized form, NH3, because it's not charged, it will readily pass through cell membranes and lipid bilayers. It enters tissues and organs and will enter gill structures. And so it's considered the more toxic form of ammonia because it can enter the body so easily. And as you can see in this graph on the right, um, the percentage of unionized ammonia increases as pH increases and as temperature increases. So most freshwater systems have a pH of around eight, 
Um, and at that pH, the percentage of unionized ammonia as opposed to ionized is about 10% or maybe even a little less. But if you can increase the pH to nine and a half, um, that can increase the percentage of unionized or toxic ammonia to almost 80%. If you can get your pH up to around 10 and work in water in warmer water temperatures, then you could increase that percentage up to almost 90%. Um, so it is relatively easy to increase the toxicity of ammonia just that much by increasing the pH and the temperature. So before I started my master's last fall, um, Eric Fry was finishing up his master's at NAU with Rebecca and David, working on a very similar project. Um, he was looking at ammonia as a tool against invasive fish. And Eric came up with this formulation of ammonia that he used in the lab of about 0 0.02 grams per liter of ammonia. Um, and found that that concentration could kill green sunfish and fathead minnow in about two hours. Um, black bullhead catfish are much hardier, <laughs> so they required a slightly higher concentration of ammonia, 0 0.026, um, but Eric was, was able to kill all three species in less than four hours using that concentration. Um, and there were a series of studies done from 2011 to 2018, um, these experimental ammonia treatments, um, 13 studies and 11 different sites targeting a number of species, mostly fish, but also some invertebrates like pond snails and crayfish. And nine of those treatments were deemed effective. So they were able to kill the targeted organisms. So there's definitely potential for ammonia to be used as a tool against invasive fish, but what about using it for invasive crayfish? Um, so my research is gonna be focusing on three main questions. Um, what is the lowest effective dose of ammonia and its additives that will achieve 100% mortality in a laboratory setting? Um, what is the difference in ammonia sensitivity between the two non-native species of crayfish in Arizona, northern crayfish, and red swamp crayfish? And will these lab laboratory dosages work in the field? So last fall, I went out and caught a lot of crayfish mostly um, in Lake Mary here in Flagstaff by seining and hoop netting. Um, I did one trip down to Spring Creek in Liberty Valley and caught a little tiny crayfish with dip nets, which is pretty fun. Um, and I brought all of those crayfish to the lab um, in the Rocky Mountain Research Center and Greenhouse Facility. And I started running trials in these tanks with 100 gallons of water. And I started just trying to create this ammonia formulation that was going to be used against crayfish. So I started with the same concentrations that Eric was using for fish. Um, and that did not work at all. <laughs> it was completely ineffective against crayfish. And I realized pretty quickly that we were going to have to increase the concentration of ammonia and possibly the additives that Eric was using also. So one of the first trials that I did was just trying to compare ammonium sulfate and ammonium chloride. Eric was using ammonium chloride in his studies, um, but we realized that ammonium sulfate is approved for a pretty wide range of commercial and industrial uses. And so we thought it might be easier to work with moving forward in broadening um, the range of approvals, like possibly using it um, for invasive species. Also, ammonium sulfate is a lot cheaper than ammonium chloride, which is always a good thing. Um, and they acted pretty much the same. So now we are using ammonium sulfate exclusively. 
Then I was kind of interested in playing around with sodium sulfite, which depletes dissolved oxygen levels. Um, Eric was using sodium sulfite in his fish trials with the idea that if you lower the oxygen levels in the water, the fish are going to be trying to breathe more or trying to move more water over their gills and get that oxygen. Um, but in so doing, they'll also be getting more ammonia into their body or at least quicker. Um, so I started with pretty low amounts of sodium sulfite and did seem to make a difference having some rather than none, but still not getting anywhere close to 100% mortality with the crayfish. And then I just increased everything. Um, I increased the sodium sulfite quite a bit to get the dissolved oxygen levels down to zero and have them stay at zero. Um, I also increased the amount of soda ash that I put in, which is what we're using to increase the pH. And I was able to get my pH levels to around 10. And I even tried doubling the ammonium sulfate. Um, Luckily, doubling ammonia didn't seem to make a very big difference, so we can now continue working with the lower amount of ammonia. Um, the biggest thing here was using sodium sulfite. It seems to be the difference between getting to 100% mortality and not. So then I was interested in whether just using sodium sulfite would work. Um, and I did a trial with just that, and it did not work at all. I used quite a bit of sodium sulfite, got the oxygen levels down to zero, and they stayed that way for about a week, and no crayfish died in a week in water with zero oxygen. Um, I suspect they didn't mind that so much because they can come to the surface and get oxygen from air. Um, so it seems like we have to work with some mixture of ammonium sulfate, soda ash to increase the pH, and the sodium sulfite to lower the oxygen levels to be able to achieve 100% mortality. Okay, so my future trials in the coming months um, are going to be trying to refine our ammonium, uh, ammonium sulfate doses. We want to try to bring the amount of ammonia down as much as possible. Um, find the lowest amount that will still be 100% or still cause 100% mortality. Um, like I said, ammonia breaks down naturally in aquatic systems, but it still persists for quite some time. So the less that we put in, the less time it'll take for it to go away. Um, I also want to run some escape trials. That is one of the tricky parts of working with crayfish, um, as opposed to fish. Um, if they don't like the water that they're in, the crayfish will just leave. Um, so we want to bring the ammonium sulfate amounts down as much as possible, but it, but it still has to be high enough to incapacitate or affect the crayfish so that they won't just escape. Um, I also want to run some, I've mostly been working with northern crayfish and I want to try working with red swamp crayfish and really compare these two species and how this ammonia formulation will affect both of them. Um, and eventually we'd like to take this formulation and try it out in the field. And this is where some of you folks might be able to help me. Um, so we don't have any field trial sites yet, but we know kind of what we're looking for. Um, because of the strict regulations on biocides in Arizona, if we did this in Arizona, it would have to be on private land, or it could be on public or private land in Utah. Um, for it to be exempt from an experimental use permit, uh, it has to be less than one acre in size, have no native species, not be connected to another body of water, not used for irrigation or drinking water, and not associated with recreation or fishing. Um, and because we're going to be putting 
ammonia in this water, we would like it to have crayfish and not much else. So if anybody has any ideas about that, um, that is my email address. I'm not sure if you can see it behind the Zoom thing. Um, <laughs> but please reach out to me if you know of any places where this might work um, or have anything in mind. It would be great to talk about it. And I think that is all we have. Um, here's my email address again, if you know of any potential field sites and would like to help me do my research. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much for listening. And um, if anybody has any questions, be great to hear them. I'll exit my screen share. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susan. Very interesting work that you're doing. Very hardy creatures. <laughs> yes. Very, very um, impressive. Just impressive. <laughs> um, did have one question so far, um, and I apologize if you mentioned this, but I know that you said you collected like some younger crayfish and some adult crayfish. Were all your trials um, just on the larger crayfish or were they on a mix? Yeah, I did all my trials on larger crayfish and tried to keep them kind of all the same size. Um, it would be really interesting to try some trials with smaller crayfish if we get around to it. But for now, just kind of trying to focus on the adults and have them all be a similar size. Across the small range that you've experimented with so far, it doesn't seem like size has had a super obvious effect, but you haven't used really, really young ones. Yeah, that's true. And it's people that have done, it, it seems like smaller crayfish, I don't know, for some treatments, they seem to be more susceptible to chemicals and then other people say that they're not as susceptible. So it would be pretty interesting to try something just to see what ammonia might do to them. But um, yeah, from what I've done, there has been a, a range and haven't really been able to see too much of a difference in the, between like the different sizes. Interesting. Uh, it, Matt su is suggesting trapping the big ones and then um, chemical treatment of the smaller ones. Would, are you thinking like if the smaller ones are more susceptible and that could let you have a lower dose overall, Matt? So potentially it was kind of half that and then half, um, you know, the mention early on that larger crayfish are easier to, to trap. Um, I don't know. So it's just thinking about potential combined approach. The crayfish yeah. are also fun to trap and then eat because they're also tasty. So. <laughs> Um, a lot of the um, research and reviews that I've read um, have all kind of agreed that this is such a big, difficult problem that it's probably going to take a whole slew of treatments and methods to be able to deal with it. So that could be one option of like finding a biocide like ammonia to target a size class and use it in conjunction with the trapping. Um, there was one study that I read where they, that trapping actually worked because they introduced a predatory fish in conjunction with the trapping. So yeah, these crayfish are so hard to kill that it probably will take a combination of all sorts of whatever we can throw at them, so. Um, Teresa, yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, so hi, I'm Teresa Thome. I am in our Pacific region, so I'm like a little, I'm just a little west of, I think, where you're working. But uh, we have some good examples of work on rusty crayfish in the Columbia River Basin um, for modeling, occupancy modeling, removal, some trapping, uh, some treatments with uh, not ammonia, but uh, rotenone. And I'd be happy to connect uh, with you on potentially um, expanding your field sites if you want to work in 
a couple different states, <laughs> but there's definitely some opportunity not much with um, the two species you're looking at. Um, but I also had a question. Um, I was curious with the IMAP invasives database, um, are some of your sites or the sites where you're showing invasive crayfish, do you know if th those are so, um, documented with the USGS? Aquatic species database because um, I I I know there's you know different ways to find where where different species are located but we use the USGS database a lot too so I was just curious. Um, yeah, I did look I have been using the USGS database um, and yeah I don't the IMAP is just kind of there are a couple from USGS. Um, a couple observations from USGS and I, I don't know, I think people go on there and just enter their own observations on that site. Um, Rebecca, do you know? I think it's trying to pull from as many different sources as possible. So it's pulling from USGS records and game and fish records and some individual um, more citizen community science stuff, as far as I can tell, is lots of different data sources. I'd be worried about IMAP because I've seen many in incorrect uh, identifications on there. So far, we've been using it just as a place to see, contact people and see if there are in fact crayfish where they're on that map. And uh, so far it's worked, <laughs> but we're not like modeling uh, occurrence or anything using that data. Yeah, we're currently trying to find um, where we can go catch red swamp crayfish and possibly do an experiment on them where they are. So we've mostly been using it for that, um, like where we could possibly catch red swamp crayfish down around Phoenix. Um, there is one observation on that IMAP uh, map for that there is a red swamp um, observation here in Flagstaff that we're kind of interested in following up on because we didn't think that they were here yet. So, yeah, I was I was surprised too. Not that rusty that rusty crayfish were not documented in Arizona um, yet. So that's that's good news. And then I just wanted to add in too that Montana, the state of Montana, especially through Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks, is doing a statewide uh, working toward a statewide crayfish. So not just invasives, but just looking at native distribution as well. So um, that's some pretty neat research, just knowing that uh, crayfish are important in aquatic uh, communities and they do, uh, whether they're native or invasive, they are, yeah, they're an important part of the ecosystem. So anyway, thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks again, Susan. I'm gonna have to move us along to the next presentation. Um, but again, I think Susan's info is in the, in the chat, so feel free to continue these conversations. Um, and I will go ahead and introduce our next um, presentation. Uh, so for this next presentation, Dave Rogowski and Ryan Mann from Arizona Game and Fish Department will provide updates on their assessment of native and non-native fish movement through the Pierce Ferry Rapid on the Colorado River. So I will hand it over to you, Dave. Okay, hopefully it should be up for everyone. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is a very collaborative work uh, between ourselves, Game, Game and Fish and BioWest uh, and all the folks that are listed here that helped me out as well as the folks on BioWest. I'm gonna start out basically talking about basically how we came to this, uh, to this project. Um, so Arizona Game and Fish, uh, has been doing some long-term monitoring in the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon, uh, basically from Lake Powell to Lake Mead since the, uh, for the last 21 years. Um, and it's geographically broad. And this, here's just a shot of an image of our sampling in 2021, basically launch at these ferry, basically is where everyone launches to go raft down the Colorado River. And depending on how many nights of sampling we have, dictates how many reaches we sample. And these are the reaches we sampled um, last year. And so Marble Canyon basically is from River Mile Zero to the Little Colorado River. Uh, and, and the 
Colorado River main stem kind of changes once we go a little Colorado River, it dumps in some uh, sediment, so increases turbidity. And as, as you go downstream, the temperature warms up quite a bit. Uh, in the Western Colorado, Western Grand Canyon, we're considered basically from Kanab Creek on, on down, and then far Western is kind of this area over here, uh, Diamond Creek, and then Pierce Ferry. So we're sampling an area about 281 miles. And so what we've noticed over time when we sample it, and, and the methods that we use to sample is we're looking at the whole fish assemblage. So we use electrofishing. We've been using hoop nets since 2016, uh, as well as angling at each of these targets, different species of fish to get a good representative idea of the, where the, the fish distribution and relative abundance is. And what we've noticed over the time periods, um, and this figure here shows that. So we have non-native fish in red and our native fish in blue. And on the x-axis, we have Colorado River Mile. So this is a percent native fish in the Colorado River, basically in the Grand Canyon over our study area. And so a couple of representative years in 2004, 2009, and 2020. Um, so we have Marble Canyon here, Eastern, Eastern Grand Canyon in the middle, and Western Grand Canyon on the right. Um, and notice over time, we've been switched basically from red to a lot more blue. Uh, so we're getting a lot more native fish. And so one of the questions is why, why is this occurring? What is happening? And just, just for historical precedence, before the dam was put in, the most common fish in the Colorado River in this reach were essentially common carp and channel catfish. Uh, and then over time, when the dam was put in, uh, the tailwater, the cold water, uh, and we had rain, rainbow trout were stocked in there for a while. So in Marble Canyon, all these non-native fish are primarily rainbow trout and as well as brown trout. And then as you go downstream, the water warms up and we get more and more native fish. And we're seeing more and more of that as the years have progressed. And so basically here's a, a table of all our non-native fish. And that used to be dominated by brown trout, common carp, uh, some channel catfish, red shiners. And so there's a, as well as fathead minnows. And these are not to scale. Fathead, fathead minnows and red shiners are only about an inch, inch and a half. Just to give you an idea how, how it's changed. And this is kind of our, just our rare non-natives. Our native fish species include the flannel mouth sucker, blue head sucker, speckled dace, humpback chub. And so why would we see this change in our, you know, native fish, so non-native fish to native fish? And so one thing to think about is the declining water level, say, in Lake Mead. And so this graph shows uh, historically what it was here on the right-hand side from the dates from when uh, Lake Mead was created until current here, which is the blown up version down here. And so a spillway elevation up here in blue, like elevation, meat, lake meat elevation, as you know, has been declining and declining since basically 2000 until about 2021, we're at the lowest levels that we have seen. Uh, and what has that, what has that occurred? Well, to give you an idea of what it used to look like when we we're sampling the Grand Canyon, I used to basically sample down to Lake Mead, and this is the extent of Lake Mead in 2000. Uh, so Pierce Ferry is where people now take out and where they used to take out in the past if you're grafting down the Grand Canyon. Uh, prior to that was in Diamond Creek or people still do in Diamond Creek, which was uh, essentially 50 miles upstream from that. And the Grand Cliffs wash, wash here, this is area basically where Lake Mead National Recreation Area begins and Grand Canyon uh, ends. So this is what the lake looks like in 2000. So it backed up basically the Grand Wash Cliffs and Pierce Ferry is about river mile 281 right now. And the lake, actually, in the 2000s, the lake, uh, so we had clear water all the way up to River Mile 200, about 240, 245 or so. Uh, it's hard to find good definitive answers where the extent of the lake was. But to compare that to what it looks like in 2015, and this is more similar to what it is now, it's even reduced even more. And so here's our ground wash cliffs. And essentially what has happened is we've increased the riverine habitat by uh, almost 70 miles of river habitat. And during that time, in this area here with Pierce Ferry, there's a little pinch point here. The river changed channels a little bit and created Pierce Ferry Rapid. And this started developing somewhere around 2010 or so. And by 2019, this picture here, and that's me standing in front of it, and I'm about six foot tall. Um, it's quite a drop and it's about a 180 degree bend in the river. And so we started wondering, we saw this decline in non-native non -native species, increase in native species, if this barrier, this rapid might be a barrier to fish movement. And so one thing we did take a look at, so we, look, we noticed that particularly with our channel catfish, early 2004, five and six, we were, act, we were 
to catch catfish, you need to just stick a line out there uh, and you would catch a catfish almost every single time. And so here's Colorado River Mile on the x-axis and there are years up here. And this is for our angling data. So if you caught a catfish, it's marked by a, a circle here. And the area that's gray is at times that were not sampled. We did not angle, we did not angle in that area. In our initial sampling, we did not go all the way Pierce Ferry Rapid because the lake was actually over here, basically around 250. And so as the lake has receded, we increased our sampling. And so now actually we stopped some at Pierce Ferry Rapid because we could no longer, we could not go over Pierce Ferry Rapid safely. And actually it was, it's illegal to do that according to the Park Service. But what we did notice is we're just in channel catfish, we said, well, what about channel catfish on the other side of the rapid? And so we started doing some preliminary sampling in 2018 down there. And we noticed we were catching catfish pretty regularly, fairly easily, basically about two catfish per hour. And this is by hook and line. Uh, so it also gave us some more, in, more information about this acting as a potential barrier to fish movement. And BioWest has been doing some work down here too as well. And they've been looking at the inflow for razorback suckers, which, which occur in, um, the only natural population occurs in Lake Mead. And they had traveled back and forth between the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River, and Lake Mead. And we start, they started noticing around 17 or 18 or 19 that that movement has had stopped almost completely. And those, the razorback suckers were not moving up and up back and forth between the rapids. And so um, this all led us to let's start sampling below Pierce Ferry Rapid. And so just basically see what fish was there. And we got some funding from the National Park Service going through uh, Lake Mead to sample the native fish there and started working with BioWest, uh, who was also doing some work there. And then we also got some funding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service most recently um, to do put some pit tag antennas down there, and I'll explain those in a little bit. Uh, but essentially, we're co we continued our sampling that we did on the main stem. This was funded by Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program through the USGS Glen Grand Canyon Research and Monitoring Center, uh, and we continue to do that work up, up above upstream of Pierce Ferry Rapid. Uh, but they're also supporting us indirectly with some logistics below the rapid. Uh, the Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is supporting work to do our electrofishing, saying hoop nets and angling, and the pit tag antennas at the rapid and below the rapid. And BioWS is also complementing some more work, and they're being primarily supported by the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, so we're coordinating with BioWest and ourselves to sample upstream and downstream of the rapid and combining data from a variety of different projects to look at fish movement uh, around this rapid and see if it is a barrier to native fish as well as our non-native fish. So is it preventing our non-native fish from going up in the canyon, which is a great thing, unless it's preventing our razorback suckers from going into the Grand Canyon, which we rarely catch. We catch maybe one razorback sucker per year on our trip on average. Uh, so this picture here is basically near as uh, the lower section of the Colorado River below Pierce Ferry Rapid. And so our sampling, and this is what we sampled in 2021. So angling, electrofish, and hoop nets, and sanding. This is both game of fish and BioWest. So we get a pretty well good representation. So our rapid is right here. It's a little pinch point. And so you can see it's not quite even sampling, um, but we do have a good representation, good distribution of our samples, as well as a good picture of the assemblage of the fishes that are out there. So the first thing we looked at is, is our difference in the fish assemblage upstream and downstream of the rapid. So if you have different species upstream and downstream would suggest that it is acting as a barrier. <clears throat> and so this is just a table listing all our sample, number of samples since 2019 to 2021, when we formally started this project. Um, so a fair amount of samples, as you see, they're not totally even. Um, it's kind of hard to do where we're pretty much merging three to four different projects into this. But, but our results are, if you look at all the, number, the numbers of fish, so in green and then red font is all our non-native fish species. And this is our overall catch. And then on the top section is our native species. So bluehead sucker, flannel mouse sucker, humpback chub, speckled dace, uh, and some hybrids. And so you don't have to tabulate all this, but the main message is if you look upstream and downstream, upstream are native fish, 8,000 fish, Downstream, non-natives are 2,000 fish that we've captured, uh, not equal sampling, uh, but essentially less than 1% non-native fish above the rapid and, um, and around 10% of native fish below the rapid. Uh, so based on this, the, the difference in the fish assemblage is above and below. And this is a walleye for folks in Arizona that really haven't seen one before. Um, 
there's a significant difference in the fish's assemblage. And statistically, this proven about using a variety of statistical methods. And this is just a graphical represent representation of that. Uh, so our upstream is in blue with a much tighter circle here and it's consisted primarily of native fish where downstream it's a much wider circle and we have it's pretty much dominated by non-native fish red shiners fathead minnows channel catfish common carp those are all non-native species and our native species pretty much centered around the upstream bit so one thing to add is that we've been doing a lot of work not just us but the park service you say fish and wildlife service uh, USGS in the Grand Canyon, where we've tagged and marked all our native fish essentially above 150 millimeters, uh, except humpback chub, we start marking the, mark those down to um, about 85 millimeters. And so these fish can be recaptured either mainly or detected on remote antennas. And just to give you an idea of the amount of work that goes in the Grand Canyon between all our different projects and agencies, in 2020, 30,656 fish were tagged. And these are with pit tags, and I'll explain what those are. This is a picture of a flannel mouse sucker, our, our normal processing. Uh, so we have a scanner and our tags are preloaded in these little uh, basically injection guns. And we basically tag all our native fish and Below the rapids, we're tagging non-native fish just to look at movement. So the pit tags, this is what one looks like in my hand. You know, hand's pretty big, they're only about 12 millimeters. Uh, typically, if you capture them like angling or netting or electrofishing, we scan them individually with a, a little scanner, handheld scanner. And more recently now, more and more folks are starting to use these um, uh, pit tag antennas. So you can place them out there. And here's a picture of a Razorback sucker. This is from Martian Associates. These are the ones we are using. As a fish swims over it, these are basically radio frequency ID tags, just like you would give your pet to identify them. As the fish swims over them, um, it picks up that tag and records it. And so what we've done is we put pit tag antenna array around the rapid. So this is rapid here in the middle. Uh, we put four upstream in sort of the slack area on just above the rapid, and we put two downstream. Um, these are not to scale. Our antenna arrays are only about, they're about four feet wide by two feet long, or the other way around, two feet wide, four feet long. Uh, they're rectangular. We set them on the bottom. The one in red here is because that one uh, got destroyed and is no longer working. It got wedges, in the, wedges down there in the rapids. So due to the high fluctuating flows. Um, but all the rest have been working on and off. And this is just antennas. These were placed in there. Uh, November of 2020. So we have one year of data and we'll be going out, I believe in May to do our sampling again and we'll download the antennas. Um, our antenna six, which is the one below the rapid has been working beautifully. And um, the whole time period where the other ones have been a little on and off. Some of them got removed, some of them got destroyed by cattle. Uh, we've had to fix them a few times. So I didn't think I'd have to worry so much about cattle destroying fish equipment, but it's, it happens. Um, so our antenna detection, so river flow is from uh, your right to your left here. And so upstream and downstream, uh, here's our detections. Uh, the red ones in red are common carp and channel catfish. Those are non-native fish species. And these are unique, unique individuals. Um, so sometimes we've captured many of them, many times we detected them. Uh, so by far up, downstream and upstream is flannel mouse suckers. They're most populous, most abundant fish in the Grand Canyon. Uh, and then most likely, then razorback suckers below and humpback chub below. And then of course, carmen carp um, found in a lot, a lot of the common carp detections below, which is kind of interesting because like our channel catfish, upstream of the rapid, we catch very few carp anymore, like 16 or 17 uh, common carp uh, in, in one of our trips. So with channel, channel catfish. Uh, and upstream of the rapids, flannel mouse suckers, bluehead suckers, uh, and one common carp. And so there's 350 unique fish in total. And for nine of these nine of these fish, we don't have information on their tag. So we don't know what the species of fish is or when it was tagged. And so with this information, we can look at movement. So how many of those fish were tagged upstream and how many were then recovered downstream or detected downstream or vice versa. If they were tagged downstream, how many of them might have moved upstream? Um, so we had one fish uh, that was tagged below the rapid that has been de detected upstream. So this was a flannel mouth razorback sucker hybrid. It was, um, it was actually tagged in 2017. And we detected on our 
one of our antennas on March 7th, 2021. So that doesn't mean that's the date it moved upstream. It could have moved upstream anywhere from when it was tagged below in Lake Mead, say 2017, or at the inflow. So anywhere between 2017 and 2021, it might've moved upstream. So that indicates at least during that time period that um, this was not a barrier to fish movement. And uh, we have quite a few downstream movements. So 116 carp have were tagged upstream and have only been, now have only been detected downstream. Same with 40 flamingo suckers, 15 humpback chub, and one razorback sucker. And these are all fish that originally tagged upstream, now have only been detected downstream. Um, so movement downstream, no surprise. Uh, the movement upstream of one fish is a little bit of a surprise, but also have to understand that we're much less fish have been tagged downstream of the rapid. So we had like 30,000 fish tagged per year above, above this rapid. Downstream, um, probably only a couple hundred fish. So it's a matter of numbers there. And we only have one year of data. Um, and so here's our species detections by date and locations. And so if this also as the size of the fish, uh, and so here's our different species, channel catfish here, common carp, the next one is flannel mouth sucker. Um, flannel, this is a flannel mouth razorback hybrid, FRH, humpback chub, and a razorback sucker. Uh, interesting that a razorback sucker, so they do occur in Lake Mead more so than they do in the Grand Canyon. Um, and our humpback chub detections on both of them, common carp and channel catfish, pretty much only below the rapid now, which is pretty interesting. And then we started looking at, so these are the dates. So is there are certain times of date or is the flow of the river and how is the dam managed? Is that, does that affect fish movement as well as for fish migration and movement for spawning purposes? And so preliminary data here suggests that there is some relationship between uh, how the dam and how the river, river flow and how that affects fish movement. Um, so most of our detection, so these are individual unique fish per day. Uh, common carp are in red, flannel moss suckers are in green, and razorback suckers are in blue. And so we had most, this is for 2021, so we had most of our movements basically here um, uh, in the end of May or middle of May. And during May of last year, they were doing work on Glen Canyon Dam on the apron. So they reduced the water level. So in our flow here is in blue, cubic feet per second on the left. Uh, they dropped that down to about 4,000 CFS for a couple of days. And notice, and then they bumped it back up while they work after they're done working on the dam to, to about 23,000 CFS. And during that time period, um, we had a number of fish in our most, num most number of detections. This is all basically um, downstream detections on our one antenna there. So some indication that either it's flow or potentially it might be also related to time of year. So these are kind of coincidental and we only have one data point to check this out. So maybe, well, be interesting to see what happens this year. And so in general, in summary, uh, the fish assemblage is much different above and below, appears very rapid. It also differs seasonally. I didn't show that. Um, and also, and no surprise, it differs by the type of gear that we use. The rapid, appears very rapid, is a hindrance to fish movement, but we don't think it's a complete barrier. And some of that might be related to uh, water flows uh, and flow. As I said, flow and temperature can cue fish movement. Uh, so we don't know if it's flow or if it's temperature or if it's there's nor normal progression, migration, and movement and reproduction of fish. Uh, so it's essentially all I had. Thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or to just unmute. We've got a few minutes here, so... I have a question. Um, <clears throat> that was super interesting. I was initially thinking about like the, the rapid is a barrier to these invasive fish that are predators, and then you have an increase in native fish. What are all those flannel mouth suckers <laughs> uh, doing down below the, um, the rapid? Do you think that that's just a sink and they get eaten, or um, do they not care? Yeah, so that's one thing we're interested in, and hopefully some of our tag recapture information gives that. We had one recapture, so in hand, where we could actually measure the fish, uh, and that flannel mouth had lost a lot of weight. So it might potentially be a sink. So we are finding flannel mouth suckers down there at all different sizes, and we're finding the same as humpback chub, and it potentially might be a sink. And so we hope to find that information out, you know, uh, with more information right now, so... Um, it's, it's been pretty interesting and no one's not, there's not a lot of people working below that rapid and it's an interesting place. Um, but yeah, 
Good point. Very cool. Thanks. <laughs> I see Bernie, your, your results are amazing. Should we be putting weak fish passage barrier upstream of reservoirs and other parts of the Colorado River and on other rivers? Well, um, it's been talked about. And so this, this situation that I, I reported here is not the only one that occurs. On the San Juan River where it dumps into Lake Powell, we have a similar situation there. That one is a complete barrier to fish movement upstream. And so for the flat mouth suckers, razorback suckers, our native fish, they're now starting to transport and move those fish upstream of that barrier. So it does prevent our non-natives from going up, but it also prevents native fish from going up too. So there's a trade-off. Um, at this point, I think it's probably easier to move native fish upstream of a barrier like that than to try to, uh, you know, if you take away the barrier, then try to prevent non-natives from coming up. And Tom Jones said, do you think natives would have negotiated rapids like those at Pierce Ferry historically? Um, we're not sure. I mean, they go over, they go up and down past Lava Falls. Um, so they can, if they want to, it, it, you don't know the complete hydrodynamics of, of that rapid and whether, you know, how well and how easily fish can move up it. And if it's also related to water levels and that rapid constantly changes. Uh, and many of our native fish are long-lived fish, fly on mouse suckers, bluehead suckers, humpback chub, razorback suckers, they can live 20, 30 years. And so maybe if there's a year of high flow, then they can swim up it. And then some of the water dif differences in water temperature upstream of Pierce Ferry. So yeah, so water temperature coming out of Hoover of the dam essentially is around 54 degrees Fahrenheit or so. And by the time you get close to Lake Mead, it's approaching 70 degrees or so. Um, it's almost almost a almost a straight linear increase in water temperature. Uh, it's going through a canyon. It has very little solar radiation increase, but it does slowly increase as you go down. We have 200, well, almost 300 miles to get to Lake Mead from the dam. Well, actually, a little more than that. Um, so and that's another reason why we think some of a lot of our native fish are doing well. Um, the water temperature is much more conducive to the reproduction and growth for our native fish in the Western Grand Canyon. Um, also, as it's cutting through the Lake Mead sediments, it's also increased turbidity. So we have warmer temperatures, higher turbidity. So it's more like the natural habitat used to be before the dam was put in and much more so than what it is up near the dam where it's clear and cool water. Awesome. Any other questions? couple more minutes if we need it. I encourage everyone to go to Lake Mead and catch catfish and eat them. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> but not with crayfish. <laughs> <laughs> well, crayfish are already in there and they, they do have the uh, red swamp crayfish, Bocramus clarki in the lower part of the Grand Canyon and occasionally we've caught some orconectus, well, I keep calling them orconexus, but Faxonus viralis up in uh, Lee's Ferry. Awesome. Well, I think, um, I think I'll go ahead and just give a couple closing remarks here. Um, thank you, Dave and Susan today. Um, and thank you to all the presenters uh, who joined us over the last three months or so. If you've missed any of those discussions um, on bullfrog and crayfish research, um, as well as today's, the recordings are up on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll put the link here in the chat real quick. And today's presentation will be there as well, um, probably by the end of the day tomorrow. Next month, we'll resume our normal COP meeting program. So we look forward to seeing you all on April 21st or sooner if you'll be joining us for the American Bullfrog Workshop session on the 30th. So thank you again for joining and we hope everyone has a great rest of your week. <laughs>